community within internet social groups. And today he's here to talk to us about the tools used by game developers and the creation of new web games in his talk entitled Gamification. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Hey. How are you doing? So we're here to talk about games and <clears throat> what I'm dubbing Interaction 2.0. Uh, so uh, everyone here, how many people here would consider themselves a gamer? Not too many. Got Kevin, all right. Okay. Got one. But even as not as gamers, you guys probably can identify a lot of gaming icons. Like who can tell me who this is up on the screen? <laughs> but that's me, but I'm dressed up as somebody. Mario. Who am I dressed up? Mario, Mario, I heard. All right, so we're going to play a little game. So this is Mario from the Super Mario Brothers series. And so I'll, um, as we're talking about gamification, we're talking about engagement and getting engaged with someone. Can you catch? Ah, all right, so every time someone guesses the character on the screen, I'll go ahead and throw you a ball. Yeah, you have to yell it out first. And then, and whoever has the most balls, you can, we can go ahead and get a bat. I have this Portal 2 educational baggy thing for, as the gift. Whoever gets the most correct answers. Trade it back, all right? So who can tell me who this is? Sonic. I, I, Kevin, you got it. All right, let's see if I can get this. Uh oh. Uh, okay. Yep. All right. So, what are we talking about today? Um, what are games? <laughs> yep, that's right. What's what's his full name? Somebody, somebody, money bags. Uncle. Rich Uncle Pennybags, from, from, or Mr. Monopoly, as he's been renamed. Hey, there we go. All right, so what are games? What is the definition of a game? Something you play that has rules and something you Okay, so something you play, something that has rules, right? What else? To have fun. To have fun, right? A lot of games are for entertainment. Why else do we play games? To win. To win. Some games are competitive. Has a goal. Some, most, some games have goals. Social interaction? Social interaction. There's a lot of reasons we play games. Well, actually, there are islands in the Pacific where people play games to um, end at a tie. Right? And in tie. The other social norms, right? Yes. Other social. So we play games for a large number of reasons. Most games are an abstract system of rules. Right? They, um, they don't exist in the real world. They somehow emulate the real world. There are a series of rules that exist inside of our heads that we abide by for a short period of time. <coughs> um, they're structured play, right? And what, what is play? Play is practice. It's we're, um, we're practicing, we're learning. They're not work. A game is not is definitely separated from work, and so it's something to be enjoyed. It's something outside of our normal survival um, <coughs> routine. And yep. And one one very important thing that games can teach. Um, as long as we've had civilization, we've had games, and we've used games to teach young about social norms, about vital survival skills. And so when I talk about games, um, <clears throat> and games can be social, sometimes not. So when I'm talking about games here, I'm not just talking about video games. I'm not just talking about um, things that children play. Games are all around us. Games are all things we partake upon. And we should be using them in more <clears throat> aspects of our lives. And that's really what gamification is about. It's about taking these lessons from game design and apply them into other fields. Game and sport is the same thing or different? I'm sorry? Game and sports. Game and what? Sports. Sports. Sports, sports are a form of game. So yes. 
And what do sports teach us? Right, abide by the rules and hand-eye coordination, teamwork, a lot of hunter-gatherer skills, correct? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> also games can be augmented with various artifacts. So, what type of games out there? We can have games that we play with a ball. There's board games where we play on a surface. And there are video games, games we play with computers. And so, they're not just video games, and they're not just for children. So what are the roles of games in society? So who can tell me who this is? This is m more recent. Oh, no. oh, Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed. Um, can anyone tell me the character? He's the assassin. Yeah, he's the assassin <laughs> in Assassin's Creed. He's the most recent assassin. Partial credit at all. <laughs> <laughs> you want to catch? Sure. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. His name is Connor. He is a half Native American um, hero of Assassin's Creed 3, which takes place in the American Revolution. Um, and so, who can tell me what Connor's playing? It's not Othello. It's a very, very old game. It's a simplified version of a very old game. Nope. Nope. Go. Nope. It's not go. Um, has anyone here heard of Nine Men's Morris? Nine's. It, he's actually playing Six Men's Morris. I think that's a Six Men's Morris board, but it's Nine Men's Morris is the game. Um, and <clears throat> this is the game I often talk about in the beginning of my gamification and game design classes as an example of how games can lead to, games are cultural modules. The game probably started in Mesopotamia and evolved from Mesopotamia and has spread all around the world. You can find nine, mes nine men's Morris boards in all, even in Gaelic countries where they would carve the um, board onto the rocks and because all you need is just a few um, points and a couple stones of different colors, right? And so <clears throat> even the name, Nines Men's Morris, where did that come from? It's um, hypothesized that somehow um, since the Moors brought the game to Europe um, through Spain, that that's where the term Morris comes from. And in the game, the, game's, the game teaches about control and teamwork. Basically the goal of the game is to get three of your pieces in a row and once you get three of your pieces in a row, you're allowed to take away one of your opponent's pieces from the board. And so it's teaching about territory control. Now there's lots of classic games that teach about territory control, like Go. Um, Go is all about fencing, how to control your territory, how to protect your territory. So what do these classic games do? They're teaching skill acquisition. What's important to that society? Um, and for Go, it's about territory, right? Nines Men's Morris is about territory and teamwork. Um, what other classic games, what did they teach? Doesn't backgammon have deep historical roots as well? Ba mathematics, and mathematics and planning. Logic. Logic. What does chess teach? War strategy. War strategy, right? These are the things that were important to the people of their time, right? They also teach social, um, social bounding. They teach um, the young how to follow the rules, right? You don't play a game outside the rules or else you break the game, right? So we follow rules and there's some cultural transfer. When you play a game from another culture, you learn about that culture. You learn about their, um, what they find important and they are entertaining. So why should we use games? Well. Engagement. Uh, who can name the character? Armin yeah, we're back in there. <laughs> no, no. So I was I was playing by the rules. Cool. My hand. Oh no, you didn't have to raise your hand. Just yell it out. <laughs> All right. Hey. All right. So, <clears throat> why games? Engagement. Also, um, why are games so such a powerful <clears throat> tool for learning? They're safe to fail. Um, how many people here are familiar with the term magic circle? Perenza's magic circle. What, what's the magic circle? I'm not mistaken, and I'm not, I'm not thinking of the whole, you know, who thought of the 
is, but in a teaching or some sort of playing context, you create a space in which you can try things. Right, so you can try things. There's nothing wrong, right? Um, while you play a game, what happens when you lose the game? You lost the game. That's, that's that all that has bad has happened. It's a safe place to fail. You can make mistakes. You can try over and over again until you get it right. Um, in the real world, what happens if you make really bad mistakes? You could, you, not only do you fail, but you might have serious consequences, right? You might lose your job. You might break, um, you might break some social norm and be ostracized from the group. So games are these magic circles in which we can practice and we can fail. There are also places where we abstract the real world. Most games use some form of abstraction to simplify and ease in the player into learning. They're also adaptable to many contexts. We have games about any subject out there. And most games can be re-adapted to fit new contexts. Um, <clears throat> one of the most uh, interesting things c comes from one of our textbooks. How many people here have heard Tetris? I have played Tetris before. Um, what is Tetris about? What's the story behind Tetris? Does Tetris have a context? It was created by a Russian. It was created by a Russian. Usually you see some Russian music playing with it. But what if, instead of, what if they added a, te um, a con context to Tetris? What if Tetris was about um, trying to fit bodies together in a mass grave? It would be horrendous, but it would still be Tetris, right? So you can adapt the context to any games into whatever context you need. Um, we also have epic motivation, right? Why do so many people spend all their afternoons clicking on World of Warcraft? Because it's fun. Why is it fun? Because you're motivated, right? You're the hero. You are making a difference in the world. And games provide, basically allows the player to feel epically empowered in order to make a difference. And so that's why we try to use games and try to bring some of these adaptations into other fields. So um, video games have, oh, what, I heard, who had it? Oh, you got it to me. Who, someone else yelled out. Kevin said it first. You said it out. Someone say it out loud now. Come on. What character? Yeah, Pikachu, there you go. That's not fair. <laughs> Uh, but he learned. <laughs> oh, <you> <laughs> 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 All right, so this is Pikachu from Nintendo's um, Pokemon series. Um, so the more complex the game, the more difficult it was to manually keep track of the rules, right? How many people here remember all the rules to a lot of games? Like, how many people here know how to play chess? Most of you. How many of you know how to play bridge? Exactly, right? <coughs> it's um, more complex the rules get, the harder it is to remember them. Unfortunately, Unfor computers are natural rule followers. They will um, keep and empower and keep track of the rules for the player and thus create a world where we don't have to play games with other people. We can play games solely with the computer. Um, as such, the video game industry and the computer industry have been growing side by side. And video games have been on the cutting edge of HCI, AI, and graphics innovations. Um, how many people here have played recently with the Wii U? Anyone? It, the newest device by Nintendo. So we're bringing, basically I foresee Wii U's being the first tablet machine that many families have. They'll have a controller, a screen that they'll be able to take around the house and browse the internet, view, look at videos, and play video games on, right? It'll be, the, the video games consoles are vastly becoming the major computer comp appliance that most American families have. So, now this is a hard one. Who can, I'll, I'll give credit to someone who can tell me what game this is from. Game He's from style. Nope. <laughs> Close. Uh, nope. What is it? It's Doctor, I feel really bad because I can't think of his name from Brain Age. Yes, it's from Brain Age. Um, Dr. Kosawa. Um, 
uh, Kaoshima, sorry. <coughs> um, the app, and basically this is what we're talking about today, gamification, is the application of industry innovations in fields such as education, healthcare, advising, and et cetera. We're talking about how <coughs> we can pull these lessons we've learned from game design into these other fields. Um, now, gamification is not a uh, new thing. It's something we've been with for a very long time, and we've been doing for a very long time. Um, before the term gamification became popular sometime in the last two years, um, we had um, uh, phonology, and before that we had game studies and serious games, and before that we had edutainment. Um, it's, we've been doing this over and over again for some time, but um, early gamification projects had a lot of problems with them. Can anyone identify this guy? This is really obscure. I'm going to call him Food Man. Close. <laughs> Close. This, this superhero, this hero has a disease. Can anyone guess his disease? He is gluten. Nope. Junk food items. No, but close. Close to junk food items. No. Scurvy. Nope. <laughs> uh, how about if I give you his name and you can tell me what di his um, disease? He's Captain Novelin. Diabetes? Diabetes is correct. Wow. This was a video game made for the Super NES called Captain Novelin, in which the hero has diabetes and talks to various. <laughs> it was made by the, uh, by the pharmaceutical companies to teach kids about diabetes and about taking their insulin. Um, unfortunately, it's re really bad game. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, basically, w the problem with some early gamification is they had very little to do with um, what the subject matter was. They applied. They they have this superhero fighting food characters. And it has nothing to do with the subject matter of actual diabetes. Um, and also, they would tend to explicitly tell you quizzes and information, right? They would have a doctor come on screen and tell you a couple factoids, and then you have to answer those factoids. Well, that's not really a game, that's Jeopardy, right? It's, it's a, the simplest form of game, but it's not actually blending the design of the game into the actual learning, right? And how do we, and that's really where gamification needs to go. We need to learn how to better take the lessons of what makes games fun, what makes games entertaining, what ga makes games engaging, and somehow b blend the learning into that when we apply ga gamification to a field that's not a video game. <clears throat> also, more recently, we've been seeing more and more gamification outside of games because we have basically new technology like cell phones and pedometers and such like that. We can uh, now have the technology to incorporate games into our day-to-day -day lives. Um, how many people here have used a pedometer system or not? Two people, some, three. Yeah, how many people here have heard of the Fitbit? Fitbit yeah, Fitbit's a fun the technology. I started doing a little bit of research with it. Um, basically what we have on the Fitbit is a pedometer which has a flower on it. And the more steps that you take on, on, throughout the day, the flower grows and blooms. So you have this nice feedback mechanism that's pretty much a very simplified, gamified um, application. Okay. So who could tell me what these are? Tetris, Tetris blocks. Who was first there? Uh, back there. Uh, far back there. Let's go. Ah! Oh, uh, okay. Someone can get the ball. <laughs> All right. So my goal here is to introduce some general concepts that you could possibly use in some of your classes or some of your projects that you have around the campus. Um, so when it comes to gamification, um, three things I tend to focus with on with my students are theory of fun by Ralph Koester, um, this the theory of flow, and MDA which stands for Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. <coughs> now, what is... Yeah, here we go. <laughs> 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 Who is that? Luigi <laughs> from Mario. He's Mario's brother. Mario's brother. So, <coughs> what is fun? 
Fun is the act of learning, right? Games are abstract systems, right? We established that games are a series of rules that exist in the abstract, right? So what do we do when we play a game? It's up there. <laughs> Inputs and yeah, yeah. So what, what, what is that? So what, what, we, what is that? <laughs> I would say it's experimentation. So it's experimentation. So what is, but so what is experimentation in this case? What do we call experimentation when we do it with a game? Play. Play. Yeah. It's called play. So when we're playing, when we're having fun, we're experimenting with the abstract system. And so when we, um, as we continually test and play the game, and we, we can start to predict how the game's going to react to our inputs, then we've completely learned the system, or groped it as Koister terms. It's a term he f got from a book, but I can't quite remember the book. But um, groke is a term of you completely understand something intuitively, right? I might be, I might be, okay. <laughs> Um, so basically, that's what we want our, our students to do and people to do. They want to gradually understand things and stay and learn things, testing them. So theory of fun basically states that what is this term fun that we use that we have a hard time defining? Fun is learning. The actual act of learning is this feeling of fun that we're having. When we're having fun, we're learning the game. Uh, apparently, it's from Stranger in a Strange Land. Or, okay. So, how do we learn? Apparently, uh, there we go. So, this gets to a uh, further theory of flow. How many people here have heard flow before this talk? One back there. Who can tell me who these guys are? are those Pikmin? Yes, they are Pikmin. <laughs> Dang, all of them. <laughs> all right. So, um, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, um, a researcher in HCI, came up with this idea of flow. So, flow is what happens when you're in the zone working with a computer or working with an artifact. It's when you, um, one of the key components of flow is this feeling of lost time. How many people here have you know, worked what they felt like for five minutes and then looked at the clock and lost about five hours worth of time, right? And we've all, yeah, we've all done that in work or different affairs. So this is a general concept of flow that's not just unique to games. It's basically when you're in the zone, when you're become one with the machine and lose track of time, lose track of your outside senses, and f are extremely, extremely focused. Um, one of his students, uh, Genova Chen, then took this idea of flow and started taking a look at video games with it and said, well, video games are really good at flow. Video games are really good at flow, and why are they so good at it? And so he came up with this general diagram, which a lot of people have been um, expanding upon since then. So what do get video games do? Well, they start out with all people, when they start playing video games, they're beginners. They don't have much skill, but they don't, they're not given a really powerful challenge, right? They're, they're, they're expected to, to start the game. You just press one button, get that out of the way. And then as the player increases their skill, increases their understanding of the abstract system, the challenges get harder and harder. Therefore, basically, the goal of a good game is to stay in the sweet spot, to stay in flow at, at all times. So as the, as the player learns and learns about how to play the system, they get increasingly challenged about the boundaries of what they can do, right? So what happens when flow goes wrong? Well, if you're really, really good at the game and can predict it and it's not very challenging, you get bored with the game and you put the game down. If you get really, if the game is too hard, you keep on challenging and you can't predict what's going on and you get frustrated, you get anxiety and you put the game down. So a really good game, it stays in this sweet spot of the perfect flow state. 
you did mention that this applies not just to games. Yes. Now, the thing that, that, it, that it just came to my mind that I have to interrupt, which I hope it's not. No, no problem. It's like, I, um, when I got my PhD, most of the thing I did was program in APL. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know APL, but it's very symbolic language. And there is a definite fact that you are in, I can remember the state, the janitors felt sorry for me, because at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I would be in the lab trying to write code in APL. Yep. They would come in, but you get in a state right. where, like, you know, people talk about documentation. They say, no, oh, no, um, you know, oh, that's trivial. Don't document that. I mean, you should document everything. Yeah. And I say, no, sir, there's no way I can forget this. Right. Two days later, I look at that code, and I have no idea where it came from. Right. So I was in a state. If you look at, I see uh, Zora right in front of me. If you're trying to prove some theorems uh, of the systems of the queen, there, there's a, eventually you reach a state right. where, you know, everything is so it's, clear it's here. that even your own self, you may not be able to understand yeah. where that yeah. came from two days ago. Right. So you say, yeah. why am I bothering all this? But I'm asking you, when these guys... Basically, game, good... Maintain it's the flow. Game yeah. that, that, basically, that's what we want to know. That's what good game design does is keeps the state um, and one of one of the and it's to a degree yes it's transferable um, one of the things that has developed from this has been a term called dynamic difficulty adjustment right it's a design where as in the when the player starts to edge out into one of these two different zones the game will recognize that you has some metrics to measure that and then readjusts its play style to bring the player back into the flow state. So um, if you take a look at some of his thesis games, there's a game, one of his games is called Flow. Um, how many other people have played some of his other games? Um, he also has a game called Flower and Journey on the PlayStation 3. Um, they're really beautiful games and a great experiences. They don't take very long to play. I suggest going out and getting them. But he takes this idea of dynamic difficulty adjustment in order to pull the player back into the state of flow. <coughs> and finally, um, this is all good, but then how do you design that, that, that dynamic system? How do you design a game? Um, <coughs> so who can tell me who these guys are? Pac-Man Ghosts. Pac who, can, who can actually name them? You got one more. And dot. Nope, it's not dot. It's the same one. Everybody else Yep. He he doesn't follow the he doesn't follow the. It starts with a C. Clyde. Who got Clyde? Yeah, that was Clyde. Inky Blinky. Inky Blinky. Or, or. Blinky Pinky Inky and Clyde. Um, so. What we have here is the MDA framework. Um, this was developed by Mark LeBlanc, um, developed in the, um, at one of the game developers, um, game developer conference um, that's usually held in San Francisco. And they developed this framework for both critiquing and designing games. And in this framework, we have mechanics. Mechanics basically are the rules of the game. It's what we, do is what we, um, it's all the bare bones code rules structure that form the foundation of the abstract system, right? Dynamics are the, how the rules interact with each other and the resultant behavior that the rules reinforce. So for example, um, <coughs> if you're playing a game whereas um, you have to build towns, and you have only access to some resources, but other players have access to other resources. What would be dynamic that results from that? You get angry at those players. You get angry at those players, or you have to eventually do what? You have to trade with those players, <laughs> not cheat. So eventually, it, encourage, it, it encourages economy because you have to start training with his, you have to network with the other players in the game in order to get the resources you need. And finally, aesthetics is the last part of this, which are the fun part of the game. It's the um, context, 
it's the art, it's the wow factor, it's the elements of the game that the player's first exposed to when they play a game. So in this framework, the designer theoretically is going from the rules out to create a particular aesthetic, while the player is coming to the game through the aesthetics to try to understand the dynamics, to try to understand the rules. So the player is going from this direction out there, while the designer is coming from that direction in there. <coughs> and so what types of fun are there? And so who can tell me who those guys are? Space yep, Space Invaders. Do they have names? No, they do not have names. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Oh, no. <laughs> Two sh we'll work on that. All right, so LeBlanc, who was one of the authors of MDA, um, his contribution was most on these eight types of fun. Um, LeBlanc was a game designer. And these are the eight types of fun he found of the type of ex aesthetic experiences one gets from a large variety of the video games out there. Um, so we have sensation, which is the game's a sense play pleasure. Um, basically, looking at all the pretty lights, all the um, all the special effects, all the art sensations that you get from playing a game. Fantasy games is make believe. So being in another world, experiencing things that you couldn't experience in the real world. Um, narrative games is unfolding unfolding story. A lot of games are narratively driven. You're compelled to play the game because you want to know what happens next. Um, challenge, game as an obstacle course. A lot of gamers play games because they are difficult, that they want to be challenged. They want to be, defeat the game. Fellowship, games as a social network. This is where we get to a lot of the MMO fun, where you're playing games with other people socially and um, becoming friends with those people. Discovery, um, being able to explore a virtual world, see what's over that virtual hill. Um, see the world that the developers have created. Games as expression, um, a lot of games you create your own avatar. You create your own virtual self and that's a form of self-expression. And games as submission, games as a mindless pastime. So sometimes you just need to zone out and games allow that as well. Now he says that this is not be all end all t types of fun out there. There could be other ones out there. But it's been a fairly good list of things you try to look for when you're trying to design a game. What types of experiences you're trying to reach. Would you consider empathy in this? Empathy would probably fall under fellowship. But yeah, it's um, being able to, all the social parts of the game kind of fall into the fellowship aesthetic. And so how do we then apply these things? Who could tell me who that is? It's, it's it, Gandhi, okay. Yeah, I got that one. All right, <laughs> all right. Uh, can you tell me what game he's in right now? Civilization. Yes, Civilization. Wasn't there, wasn't hey! There, wasn't there also an art installation where a guy recreated that walk on a treadmill with a virtual reality? Um, yeah, There's been plenty of those. Walk. It was a couple of years ago. He, he oh. walked, as he walked on a treadmill, he would go through and people could join in and talk to him as he went. So, <laughs> so um, how do we uh, uh, get learning inside games? Well, there's two main ways you can do it. You can have implicit learning, right? Learning through the actual playing the game itself. So what do games like Rock Band teach you? Well, they teach you things about rhythm. They don't actually teach you how to play a guitar, but you're going to know, learn some hand-eye coordination. You're going to learn a lot about rock music throughout the ages. You're going to learn how to play in a team, right? Um, how many people here have all, we all know how to play chess, right? What's one of the most important conce concepts in chess? What should your pieces be doing, what should your pieces be doing together? Defensive, right? You should never lose a piece without taking a piece in return, right? And so that's a very important in military strategy. And that's what's implicitly learned through playing chess. If you don't defend your pieces or your pieces don't work together to defend themselves, you're going to have a very bad time. <laughs> and so you're implicitly learning that lesson through the playing of the game of chess. Um, explicitly, 
we do have ways of putting learning inside games. Um, Assassin's Creed has a history database inside of it. So whenever you walk through a historically important building in the game, an encyclopedia entry pops up and you can read about that explicitly about what happened at that location. Um, the world cultures and civilizations, civilization has something called a civilpedia, which is whenever you come across some sort of technology or some sort of factoid, it, you can learn more about that factoid. Now, what, are, what do you guys think? Which is the more powerful way of introducing learning inside your games? Respect the implicit one. Yeah. Uh, I personally push for the implicit one because that's the harder one to do, right? It's very easy to enter in an encyclopedia into whatever you're doing. But to actually design the game to implicitly teach the player is what we are trying to do and so what's difficult to do. Do you think that some games teach us some Possibly. I don't, there, there's been a lot of arguments about that, um, especially when it comes to violence. Um, there have been a lot of violent games out there. I would say no more so than any other movie or any other form of media. Um, they're primary forms of entertainment, and when it comes to entertainment, as again, I told these games are not just for kids. They're also for adults. So when you take a look at a game like Grand Theft Auto, you're taking a look at basically what Grand Theft Auto is, is a commentary on the crime culture and crime movie culture of the 90s. So you can take a look at each individual Grand Theft Auto game and relate it to a series of movies that preceded it. So when you take a look at Grand Theft Auto 3 or 4, you can take a specific look at um, the crime movies about gangs in New York and um, the mafia in New York. You take a look at Vice City, it's talking about the drug trade in, the, in Miami. You take a look at um, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, and you take a look at the gangster culture in the West Coast, and the African American um, culture that <coughs> um, um, associated with it. Uh, the, um, um, the movie um, Boys in the Hood was very much um, influenced on that game. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, no problem. <laughs> Sorry. You know, but also these these games, I mean, they have age limits on them. Granted, the kids pay yes, attention to them, but they are designed for, for a, 17 or 18 and older. Yes. And so these, you know, anybody younger should not be playing these. Yes, games. they should not be they playing. They really influence them, and they know that those influences they have on, say, the preteens. Yes, they can. And, and, and again, nobody yeah. listens to that, but. Yeah. But do, do those kids also see those movies? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, I don't know if we know that that will have that effect on kids. No, we don't. I suspect that okay. it might, right. but it's hard to get the idea. Like but I guess my question was about the implicitness of games. If we think that games and gamification is good to teach people how to experience other cultures because they're yeah. engaging, it should work no matter what mm -hmm. the culture is. Yeah. So we could use games if we really wanted people to understand the culture of crime and violence. Exactly. Um, Get the because some people obviously get benefits from that culture and so mm -hmm. they enjoy it. Exactly. So is that is, is games good for teaching that? Are games Can, good for teaching that? I mean, that's or are, are, is video good for teaching it? Is yeah. is text good for teaching it? Should we? I mean, should we ban books that cover <laughs> no, no, these? Games are different because they're more engaging. Yeah. That's so the argument on the yeah, side, side, side of things engaging. engaging. So it has to flow both ways. Right. If to push the question of harm to a higher level. If you can imagine lots of young people zoned out, having eight kinds of fun right. all day long uh, <laughs> in the future, uh, couldn't, couldn't you imagine a society that by today's standards is simply mentally ill? No. Serious question. No, I, just, I'm, and I'm giving you. I don't. I don't think that games are capable of replacing reality, but they are a very powerful form of augmenting reality. Um, and I think that um, there are, is, I would acknowledge that there are some ethical concerns um, um, placed upon the designer of the game to make sure that they're not abusing the ability of games to be engaging. Um, one, of the most, um, one of the most popular examples I have of this 
is when you take a look at MMOs, and massively multiplayer online games. And you take a look at um, early MMO design was built to try to make the player play as much as possible. If you take a look at early games like EverQuest, the game was designed with key items, such as boots that allowed you to walk faster and experience more of the game more readily. But this item was dropped by one monster per server that spawned like once a, once a day. And so you would have people camping out at their computers for over 24 hours to try to and, and have a whole schedule set of who gets the monster next in order to get this item. And it was very disruptive and a lot of people lost a lot of time to the games like EverQuest. Then World of Warcraft came around and said, here, well, we don't want to make a game that wants to become a second job. We don't want to ruin our players' lives. So we're encouraging the players to try to take it one step at a time. So they designed a XP system that encourages playing in short periods of time. You get more experience and to more ideally level up, you would only play it for a certain amount of time and after your bonus thing, you would log off at a inn so when you log back on, you get that bonus again. So you can design the game to try to mitigate a lot of the negative effects. So, um, n yes, that's Mega Man. Kevin again? Yeah, you got enough balls. <laughs> uh, so, oh yeah, she just, um, who could tell me the Japanese name? Rockman. Um, so, what's the issues with um, bringing games into the classroom? Mostly, to create an effective game, one must be able to program and use art assets and create art assets. Um, games now are so high definition that you need a literal army of people creating content for your game. And we can't do that in a semester. Um, and we also have the problem of trying to get artists and programmers in the same room. It's extremely hard as you can, might guess, um, getting both people who have experiences in creating the pro, um, programming side of it and the people who have the skills to create really great art and music. So how do we mitigate this problem in order to create gamified applications? And this is what, going back to the title of my presentation of Interaction 2.0, is we, w I think what we're on the crest of is a new revolution in content creation. Um, the tools are becoming simpler to use and freer and more accessible to the general public. And so w when the same thing happened to the web, when blog sites came out and people could create their own website with a few clicks on a website, when we started being able to create YouTube videos by just taking our files and uploading them to a server that will convert it to whatever streaming format we need, when these automated processes came about, we had the web 2.0 revolution. We had a flood of information and a flood of content surge through the web and revitalize what was going on on the internet. And that's what I think is going to happen now with games. Um, we have the tools out there, free tools to create games for people who have no idea how to program. And what we're going to eventually get to a point is people are going to to create your own application is just going to be a few clicks away on your computer. Would you say though, I mean, that being able to do a sophisticated programming in art can be important, say, if you're a commercial game, but really, right. if you simplify it more, you're just honing down into, into positive reinforcement and reward, right? I mean, I'm thinking right. of something like the Impossible Game, which is a square, it's a block jumping over triangles, and right. it's, it's yes. amazingly addictive, but yeah. it's very simple in design. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're throwing balls at us, and we're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you, you know, you can, it doesn't yeah, take much, does. exactly. Yeah. You can, um, you know, you could take it potentially, the are other people taking it the other direction, too, and saying, let's take it down to the very basic, how do we, hit that center in people's brains that makes them want to play. Yeah, I mean, everyone's trying to do that because if you do that, you make a million dollars, right? You, you have that hit game out there. Um, and there's a lot of indie developers trying to do that. They're trying to create very simple, small experiences. And you can, as you, I know you're a fan of the Humble Bundle, which has a great, a lot of great in, um, independent games that are really just, they tend to be more focused, as you said. Um, so, how, some um, 
ways to do it. Uh, I heard Link somewhere here. Is that you, Carly? Yeah, okay. <laughs> what what game is Link from? Legend of Zelda. Yeah. So Legend of Zelda. Eh, here we go. He's not Zelda. <laughs> He's the hero in Legend of Zelda. Um, um, so yeah, basically this is what I'm trying to say this is possibly the next thing that we're going to do. We're having a DIY solution. Um, games have reached a point of you know, high fidelity that we're going the other direction and a lot of simple automations leading to simple 2D games, simple applications of these principles to other fields is what we, what, what we are calling gamification. So um, what, uh, one thing that I wrote about back when I was in grad school is modding. And the act of modding is taking the existing game and using the tools provided with that existing game to create a new experience. Um, so this has a number of very quantifiable benefits. One, the production software hardware can be very costly if you're trying to build a game from scratch. So by buying a game that costs 60 bucks, you have all the production tools at your hand for very cheap. Sorry, do um, Next is games require many assets. As I said, you need an army of artists to create all that art for you. Well, if you have a pre-made game, you have a huge library of art at your fingertips. So you can reuse that art in different contexts. You also have all the programming that went into creating the base of that game. And you can just modify that initial programming to expand upon the experience that you want to create. So one of the games um, that we used to make using modding and what the paper is about, if you go look it up, is using Warcraft 3 to create story time. So what we did was we had girls from high schools around the area come to the campus, we would give them a copy of Warcraft 3, and we would show them how to use the, the map maker to create their own interactive movies. And so they were able to choose out the different models inside the game as the different actors. We showed them how to position cameras and then program the camera's behavior, and then they how to program the text, and then they had their own interactive movie that they can create. They can expand upon that and make an actual interactive game, or they can <clears throat> just keep on this whole machinima angle and create their own movie experiences. So basically, modding solves a lot of the issues of not having the time and or content by providing those things with existing content. Um, oh, this was Steve from Minecraft. No one called it out. And Steve, um, Minecraft is actually um, being used in a lot of classrooms right now. There's a mod called um, Minecraft EDU, and there's lots of mods for Minecraft out there um, to try to create a more learning experience other than a survival game. Um, who could tell me who that is? Oh, it's an older game. Got everyone stumped now. I know, but okay. I'm a ringer. All right. This is Shodan from System Shock. Um, she's a AI and is a precursor to probably who's going to be on the next slide. But um, processing is a language that I started using in some of my classes. It's language built on Java and was designed to be used by non-programmers. It has very simple tutorials and you can create a visualization really, really quickly. So by typing in Eclipse and a couple parameters, you get an Eclipse to pop up in your thing. And since it's built on Java, you can, when you compile it, it creates a Java applet that can then be simply inserted into any web page. So using this sort of environment enables you to quickly incorporate, even in a class full of non-programmers, some sort of interaction. And finally, um, I've been using um, Portal and Portal 2 in my classes. Um, Portal was a successor to a student game called Nabacular Drop from students at DigiPen. Who can tell me who this is? No, it's actually not Stephen Merchant. That's that. No, that's the blue one. 
this is GLaDOS, GLaDOS, and you'll the the voice of this is going to be in that in the movie Pacific Rim as the computer AI voice in the movie coming up. But a great game. I suggest anyone who's a wants to take a look at what's happening in the AAA fields out there, take a look at Portal and Portal 2. They are terrific, terrific narratives as well, um, and terrific puzzle games. And basically in the puzzle game, um, <coughs> you have a gun. And someone saw, if anyone saw me walking around during um, the first day of classes, I had that white portal gun walking around. And what you're able to do is you're able to create a portal, a, basically a surface, um, a portal, that when which you go through, you come out in another location, um, kind of bending space um, space around you, and whatever how fast you go through the hole, you come out at the same speed from the other hole. So people use you use the, those elements in order to get around um, laboratory testing rooms. Um, this has a lot of implications for teaching physics and teaching, especially when the students are able to design the rooms themselves. So the guys at Valve created a simplified version of the map editor and gave it, are now giving it for free to schools around the nation. You can go to the Teach with Portals website and um, talk about what your institution is and um, <clears throat> how many seats you need, and they'll give you an educational version of Portal to use in your classroom. And so this is um, an element of gamification that we see here. Um, finally, who can tell me who this guy is? Almost done. It's a it's a raccoon, Japanese raccoon. It's supposed to be a tanuki. He's referred to as Tom Nook. He's the landlord from Animal Crossing. So when you're <laughs> so when your ch children are talking about paying their landlord off, they're paying this guy off. <laughs> And so, um, finally, uh, I can take a, show you some sample projects. I have an undergraduate project in Portal 2, in which the students are trying to teach, um, teach people who play the game about physics. And I was able to record this on my computer using, um, so you see, this is what the, um, portal editor looks like. It's a very simplified environment and they can drag and drop elements they want to place in the map or stretch or manipulate the room however they need to. Um, this is Dr. Kuzer and I'm demoing one of the games made by our group Team Caleb. In and so I'll go further ahead. Using these you can teleport around the map. So I'm going to hit this button, which will at least a block I'm going to need to solve the puzzle. And then I can go down here, grab the block, teleport it up to the switch that we have structured, place it on the button location. And this only takes the students about a few minutes of time to, in order to create the entire now, experience. Um, in order to finish the puzzle, I am going to launch myself at the door by using gravity. So we're using this long... Oop, I almost made it. Yeah. I can use and I eventually make it. We also have um, uh, an IDT student gamification project in which we did this semester. The student was trying to teach um, his students how to read, and he read about looking at the shapes of words as opposed to learning, looking at words and trying to match them to meaning. And so he created this game in which you go through and take a look and have to rearrange the pieces of a puzzle in order to make the word. So. Does anyone want to take a crack at this? What word are we trying to build here? Does anyone here come? Someone come up and play it. No. It's a really short word. So a three-letter word. So if you take this, 
All right, wait, so, so we got this over here. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. I thought those were eight letters. <laughs> yeah. So basically, it's playing with the construction of the word together. You get bag, and then you type the word bag in, and you test it. You got it right. And you move on to the next. Hmm. Yeah, the student, it was working earlier, but we'll get to, yeah. Um, and so we also have a student building an, under, an HTML5 game. And so they're building a very hard Mario style jumping game and they were able to do this within one semester and they created all the art and all the um, programming for the game within one semester using a, a environment called Construct 2. So the goal of the game is you have, to, you have to kill the bat and escape from the room. What? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's free software. It's free, so yeah, you can, the base version of Construct 2 is free. And you can go and play it, um, actually, if you, this last link, you can actually go and play it. Um, the, in, the, the software is linked to the Scra, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Scrilla Arcade. And after they, they have a fully web hosted game within a one semester. And yet they added instructions. So a brief narrative, and I, you know the art's not very complicated, but and so they added instructions. And the, so okay. And um, in addition to that, this is going to be our last slide. Can anyone tell me who that is? It's um, a Mog from Final Fantasy. A Mogul from Final Fantasy. His name is Mog. Um, I recently, this semester, had a, I have a friend down in York, Pennsylvania, who's, an edu who's a physics teacher. And she was looking for, she had a couple empty labs, and she needed a project to do so. So I suggested using Portal 2. And after months of negotiations with the school, they finally allowed her to install a video game inside the laboratory. And she couldn't get her students out of the class. They were so engaged. So <clears throat> the evidence is out there that gamification can work and is a very powerful tool. So I hope you guys take some of the examples I showed you and experiment with it. Thank you. Better abstract it. And so when 
uh, a lot of researchers are taking a look at um, game creation as a way of doing sustained and long-term learning with games. So by making the students go out there and create a game, they have to learn about the subject matter, they have to learn about the design process, and they have to do it over the long term or in order to actually create that product. So that's one way of doing it. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not, it's part of, as I said, fun is learning. And that short-term dopamine rush is them learning something. It's making sure that the game is designed to teach the lessons that you want to teach. I wanted to ask the same question in a different way. Yeah, eight types of fun. Are they would apply just as well, except for the first one, except for sensation. They would also apply to reading a book. Right. Or good sensation. sensation. So, why, so why is it? There's a, a good book has a great vanilla smell, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, why is it that for, you know, I mean, young people today are clearly not as fond of reading books as, uh, as fun. The So, why? What's the, what is it about the game? that keeps those, all those other types of fun going and engaging. It's the and interaction. It's the, that epic motivation that we're talking about. It's, you're, not, you're not looking through a window. You are that person. You're transferred into that virtual space. And that's the extra appeal. Well, I mean, again, this would be the same as reading the novel, where you are becoming a character in the book. Experience in but in the novel, you, 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 don't actually have, you don't have actual agency inside the book. You have to, whatever the author writes, you have to follow along with. In the game, you actually have agency to affect outcomes. It's delivered to the past which we're So, oh, you're not going to get me to agree to that. <laughs> yeah. I would consider the game really being far more effective. The, <coughs> that the only actions you have available to you are the ones that are provided by the program. The, your accurate game yes. book can be far more active, far more I mean, involved, far more, more complicated than uh, that you know, I think far greater. What's the difference between and game? Uh, that's, that's a very good question and people would argue about it. I would say the difference is the intent of the author. The simulation is intended just to abstractly recreate something that exists in the real world. A game is designed to have a goal and is designed to be entertaining. That's the problem I <laughs> And you can have you can have fun within a simulation. You can have there are all different types of games there. There are and and again it doesn't have to be a video game. You can design games, even paper prototype games, to try to teach a subject matter, to get over that initial hump of engagement with the subject matter. Right. But there, I, I think we have to emphasize quality. We had a student in the um, interdisciplinary studies who did a multi-process project. He analyzed the historic content of various multiplayer games and found a lot of problems <laughs> with a World War II game, etc. And there are a whole host of things that you could play with. But you, you get, there's this balance between, yes, it's historical, but I also have to simplify and create a narrative that people can follow. And real history is not like that. History, you know, we think it's about the smoking gun, and we'll really find this. And, you know, but very often, you know, you, we understand history because of the accretion of a lot of different details. And some might argue that with more complex programming, we could reach that state. But I don't think a lot of our customer base is going to get that for a long time. And therein lies the problem. And people who really care about history have to yeah, they have enough problems with movies and TV shows, and now with these games too, they become not, so real not, that you have to have people unlearn the oversimplifications. I don't, I don't think you have to have people unlearn the oversimplifications, but as I said, this is not to replace traditional um, educational yeah, practices. It's just to meant to supplement. It's a challenge, uh, and what we found, he also he blogged for it's IGN. I think I get the bank and this gaming I statement think stuff. IGN is a yeah. game. I use this term loosely, like journalism site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, well, I put up a blog and he started, I uh, said, yes, we'll try to post this, see if anybody kicks up, but I don't think you should. I can't think of a more polite way to say it. They did not care about his analysis. They did not care about him finding inaccuracies in World War II history or 
war, Persian Gulf conflict. Nobody cared. And, you know, and that, again, piques my concern. But a lot of people, just like they think they've learned about English history watching Ridley Scott's Robin Hood, or Scotland, Braveheart, or whatever, people are going to think they've learned history by playing complex games. Our senses get overwhelmed, and we do. We get pulled into these narratives. They work on all sorts of levels, but not in learning history. <laughs> but I think what you have to say, don't you have to you have to put a little bit on the person playing because they have to know a little bit better that they're not reading a history book. Yeah. They're, yeah. Playing. I mean, they're, the they're playing a game. Like, most people are going to like, skip those scenes say, anyway. What, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the videos advocating that form of learning, contextual learning, of just adding, put, placing your game set inside of the historical context, right. acknowledges that 90% of the people playing that game are not going to care about the historical context. Mm -hmm. But they will be a small percentage that will say, oh, that was really interesting and dive into the, and if you can just get one out of every hundred people doing that, that's still an accomplishment, at least from the designer's point of view, when that wasn't their primary goal. Going out a little bit more on the concept of gamification itself, and I've seen that word used a lot, yes. and I wonder if it should be restricted more or broadened more in your game. It's right example, now a very, very loose term. I was going to say, the example I, I'm thinking is, I, I read, it was called gamification, where they were manipulating people. There was one particular city in California where you know how they have the, um, the cameras that will take a picture of you for speeding and give you a ticket? They went the opposite way and took a picture of you if you were going under the speed limit and then put your name into a raffle or something. And, and, everybody, and, and the speed slowed down. Yeah, so Sweden. Sweden. Yeah. Sweden. But I mean, California but, did it too. Sweden. Yeah, it and was in Sweden. Yeah. So and, it was gamifying. It yeah, and it is gamification. It's a series of rules that's leading to a dynamic that's leading to a particular desired behavior. Where, so where does it go from just being gamification to behavior modification? I mean, is it really doesn't. I mean, <laughs> what makes it gamification, I guess, or at least, although at least the term being used in academia is taking um, the what lessons learned from people in game, the video game design. Um, but these, again, it, as I said, it's it's just the term du jour. It's been happening for. I've seen that some of the classes we teach are sort of structured like games. Because, like, I guess if you teach math or physics or chemistry, uh, they start out with simple rules, or if, or if you learn language, it starts out with simple rules, uh, and then after a while, I guess you get bored by those rules, and then you could increase it. It does seem that learning math, learning language, are like, you know, they do have the, the, uh, the sweet spot, or whatever you call that, uh, built into them. Uh, if you could, if you could somehow master the game idea in teaching these things, <coughs> teaching history doesn't seem like it doesn't start with a couple of simple elements and then make it more well, difficult. I mean, then I mean, again, you know, people it. like, I mean, as you said, history is not a narrative, right? But we apparently think in narratives. So by trying to take parts of history and put them into narrative context makes it easier to recall important historical facts. So maybe, you know, it's not the, it's not where you want your PhD in history to come from, but it may start them down the path to being a scholar. Maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe. I was, was going to say this is really like drug addiction. Um, <laughs> right. it's a psychological, it's, it's more yeah. kind of psychology. Because, you know, if you take heroin, uh, if you take too much, I guess that would be related to anxiety. If you take too much, uh, you know, <laughs> is there a sweet spot for heroin? <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 if, you take, if you take too little, the dose is too small. I don't know that. Uh, but as you go on, you develop tolerance to the drug. And you have to take more and more and more in order to get that sweet spot. You know, I was just going to say, I, I think what you have to be careful about is, is we grew up on books. And so when you translate that to an academic environment, you read books to learn, but we're used to that. This next generation grew up on exactly what Ibrahim was talking about. I mean, I've been in his classes. That's where they live. And I've watched my kids grow up. And so, you know, we have to sometimes think, are we sort of pushing our sense of learning 
on to the next generation and how will that work? Or will we look at the next generation and how they grew up and how they you know, experienced the world and sort of integrate that in some forms anyway? And I think in some way it's like when you show your images and we're sort of guessing, mainly because looking at our kids and how many of us have kids, but these kids grew up on this. This is where they live. So, you know, you really do have to think, you could either ignore it and say, Top, that's just games, we're not going to make that. Or you can sort of say, wait a minute, maybe there's something here. Maybe we can take something from this to build on how people look at the world. And, you know, that's just sort of something to throw out there. And, I, you know, I think we don't want to have people on the you know, overwhelmed with this. So maybe it can be dangerous. But I do think it's, uh, we don't have anyone here really from that except you maybe and your wife really grew up on this. But it is an experience that I've really seen with kids that's really interesting to see how yeah, they view the world. Definitely if you are interested in a pers older person's perspective on this, I definitely suggest taking a look at Key. Um, you know James Paul Key? He's a linguist. Um, he's a famous linguist that did a look at uh, learning language and we took a look at, he has a book called uh, what games teach us about learning and literacy, um, in which he, he started becoming a games studies um, leader. And he took a look at how these children, you know, they can't tell you much about science, but they can name all 151 Pokemon, you know, and they, they understand the language of the game. So he, he started taking a look at children and how they learn with games. And he, I think his book is a really great insight from someone because he came from that same perspective of I don't know what these games are, I don't know what these games are about. And then he started playing them and started getting involved with the game studies research. So I, I suggest reading his book. Um, and I have my <coughs> master students read his book as well. I don't know games, but I heard that folks can play a game and uh, make money. How, how does it? Is that true? Like, do why do people play sports and make money? No, no, no. People play a game online and make money. Is that true? It's the same. Well, there's a number of different ways that people do that, but it's not the norm. Um, uh, a, there's um, people who play games professionally in leagues, like sport. And esports is very big in Korea, where StarCraft II is very big. And there are big prize pots for those. Um, also, MMOs, um, not simply multiplayer online games, as I said, were designed to take as much of the person's time as possible. So, leveling up, spending, the t investing the time into those things is something some players don't want to do. So, players will do it for them and then sell their character to other people. So that's how they're making it. They're taking, they're using the limited, the time, they're basically selling their time playing the game to the other players so they can experience the game content. And, uh, Money. How, does, how does gambling fit into all of this? Because you can take, I mean, I think everyone's experienced at some point, no matter what right. game you're playing, somebody says, well, let's say we put a little, make this a little more interesting, yeah. and start putting money down on it. So that almost kind of supports it kind of the idea Basically, it fail. starts taking the game outside the magic store. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. you can't <laughs> fail, and yeah. the whole cost of But, you know, that's... And basically, it's I guess what the player, what the person proposing the bet is, is taking it up on that challenge scale of like, okay, now there's actually going to be um, consequences to this. You better not fail. After hearing what you're saying on the last thing, you know, heavy mind, it looks like a student not learning steam really. We have someone to find we should identify some tours that when they're interested in other people interesting, uh, like back to us, you know. Make a game so they learn health care things. Like people made a popular show where I would want to find a four o'clock there, back to us. It's playing game all the time every day. You wipe out other other doctors show here. So that uh, can you play for your show? Right. Uh, I was trying to get some information about technology and physics games. You can have in class, not necessarily just computer, but yeah. any kind of photo or models. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can, I mean, there's all sorts of table prototypes you can try to use in the game. And as I said, 
the, the physics, when it comes to physics, I mean, that her, she's using Portal 2, but um, there have been a lot of physics games out there. The, um, games have been a really good place to test physics. Um, there's been the Tim, the Incredible Machine, which was an old Apple II game that people made basically um, Rube Goldberg machines, right? Cause and effect. They would create the different components and use the physics to try to cause some effect to happen. You know, that's a, building those machines, building that space is a great place to learn physics. Um, but, um, I mean, there's also the use of gamification in general education. Um, there's recently been a blog post by a professor in the um, University of Michigan who's using gamification in his day-to-day -day class. So he'll come to class dressed up as a wizard. And basically he would have, instead of earning percentage points towards their grades, they earn experience points and they gain levels as they, as they, as they are participation in the class. And so it's using the, um, the structured uh, leveling system from a video game and applying it inside the classroom. And that's another form of gamification, which I don't really go into, but it's something I started experimenting in with my graduate class. Instead of having, instead of calling my, you know, you have to get X number of points on the scale, I call everything experience. You know, you have, and you have to get certain achievements, like you have to complete this assignment, this is an achievement, right? To show that you know, master this sort of subject matter. And so that's another form of gamification that's happening, is bringing the stuff from the video game world into the real world. Um, well, I was just going to say also, this is the idea of moving from instructional, from teacher-based learning to student-based learning. It's very, it's been going on for a long time. It's based on sort of Bloom's taxonomy and it's something that's been taught in education for years. It's just a different way of doing it. It's putting the student in control of their learning if you do it right. Um, you know, and it's sort of getting away from saying, here's, and now we're going to test you, which is behavioral learning, into constructivist learning, which is just a, a long time theory of, of instructional design. It's just another way to do it. Here's my kind of dilemma as, as an administrator and discussion, because I'm all for this student based and centered and learning and immersed and so on and so forth. At the same time, as I'm trying to figure out how to make the student more active, then I'm going to go with Walter, give him more ways to interact, open up the way to interact, so they're not quite as restricted as in one of these games, but so that they have all the freedom in the book. So I'm sort of, sure. It seems contradictive. I'm trying to figure out well, what's going on. Um, the idea is to give. A lot of games have what is referred to as the illusion of choice. Um, they make the player feel like they have agency, but they actually really don't. They're actually quite linear. They're actually extremely structured. So um, just by providing the illusion of choice, you increase the engagement, right? So I mean, we want we have particular goals when we're teaching for our students to reach, uh, but. We want them to feel that they have more agency over reaching those goals, and that might be enough. Um, but not some games are very sandboxy, very open-ended, allow the player to do whatever they want. Other games are very narrow. Um, just to say games are restrictive or not restrictive, it's like saying that a movie movies are always end in happy endings. No, it really depends on the author of the content. So maybe you can share some links of unrestricted games because I've no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Um, uh, I would think Minecraft would be a, a very unrestricted game. It's try. It leans more on the simulation, uh, sim, uh, simulation, simulation end of things, where you're placed in the world and you're able to build whatever you need. Yeah, it's very popular right now. Yeah, very popular. Thank you. It was maybe, it's, and also it was a, it's a great it's a programming example. This guy used Agile development. And he shows me how good his house is. Yeah. Yeah. And you see pictures online, like Minecraft is like people make giant 
edifices to popular culture and video games and things that interest them by just taking program programmed blocks and building to the heavens. Yes, so would you call Lego a game? Yes. Yes. But, the world. but it. But would you call it restricted? Is Lego restricted? But it's pretty open because it doesn't. So what I mean by restrictive is a when it kind of grabs focus in the there's very little you can do. And with Lego, I think you have a lot of freedom. Yeah, we yes. call Lego late. But, but, but Lego late. That's what But then again, some structure is good because you're able to build it's what you want. No. Right, 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 right. Directions. Use the wrong piece, then you can't make the toy. Exactly. That's right. It is a rule. Yeah. It is highly rule, but it's like it's all the interesting toys, educational aspects out of it. Yes, we have been following directions. <laughs> 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 no, we didn't. Yeah. And, and, and so, gamification, when it's applied to education, is still very hotly debated and discussed. We we could definitely use more research, and especially research for people who aren't. Game players. Yeah, I can think of something like, let's say when you go, it's not a game per se, but the United States his, um, Holocaust Museum. And I think that's brilliant. You go through the museum with, you're given a person, and at various points you sort of interact with the exhibits, and you learn that person's trajectory through the very regrettable you know, history of Europe, <laughs> and some of them live and some of them die. And I think that way you can sort of effectively teach them many, many variables went into people's chances of survival. It's it's grim, but I think it's really good. Yeah, yeah. So, that, but yeah, I mean, some people, I guess, win, some people lose, but there are also real consequences, and that's that's the gap I'm worried about. But those, those were real consequences for those people, but well, what about the people in the museum? They have real consequences. Right, right. Okay. I, 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 yeah, yeah. But you also you can't change that person's history. I, mean, I like it because it teaches value variables, but it doesn't. Like there was a, I can't remember the title of the game, but they were going to release a, a reality-based game about Persian Gulf Battle of Lula. It is called Six Days of Lula. Yes, and thank you. Yeah, and this is highly controversial because in playing the game, the outcome could change, mm -hmm. and people whose lives were affected by Actually, there's a great video online that discusses mm -hmm. the Six Days of Lula right, right. by Daniel Floyd. Right, right. right, so negotiating those <clears throat> secrets, and yeah, people's perceptions are going to be shaped by the game they play versus learning about and carefully and painstakingly reconstructing the events. I mean, yeah, well, Actually, we discussed the development of this game extensively yeah. in class, and my students were yeah. very, very interested mm -hmm. in that. They um, create narratives too. Yeah. What but. happened was that um, the developers, I forget the name of the developer, but, yeah. but they were working with the Marines mm -hmm. on building this other war game. Mm -hmm. And then the Marines got called out to Fallujah. Mm -hmm. And after Fallujah, they came back and started talking to the game developers of what their experience is during this battle. And they wish they, they had some way of expressing what happened to them. And so the developers thought, well, why don't we make a game about this? So let's, let's seriously talk about this significant historical event. And so they wanted to do it as a tribute to those Marines that they were working with. Um, originally, they thought it was a good idea. No, I'm not saying their intentions were bad, but it's. But, it was that, but their intentions was really what, what, what got called into question, especially when. The likes of Fox News got a hold of it and started interviewing them. And as soon as the press got rid of it, the controversy happened. They got they lost support of their publisher and all their funding. And so the game will never be released. It will never be made because of the blowback that it came. Because this is a game. The, the perception of this thing was we're going to let children deal with something that actually happened that affected real people. Yeah, and it was the family members of you know, family dying members dying were also upset by it. We're upset by it. But yeah. they did it, they but they're upset by it because they see it as a quote unquote game, not as a movie, not as a documentary. But if you play it as a documentary. But then what if that was the intention? But why, but why not? Why can't you no, play a documentary? The one that creeps me out. But it doesn't actually change the real world. It just changes your understanding of the world by messing around with it. And it gets people to, to 
be engaged yeah. in it. So you really could learn that, that there are choices involved and that there are different consequences. I mean, there's something attractive about this. About just because you can play through a game and how you get from point A to point B is not the actual way that it happens, you can structure a game so that point B will always be this fixed thing. For example, spoilers, at the end of Final Fantasy VII, Aerith will die. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how well you love her, it doesn't matter what skills you give her, the narrative will end with this character dying. And so, what what we don't want to happen, and what we don't want to happen is um, what happened to comics as a medium. Um, are you familiar with the comics code? Um, when comics, when um, comic books first came out, they dealt with a lot of horror stories, a lot of crime dramas, and and there was a big concern among parents that these comic books were going to rock their children's brains, and they had congressional hearings and concerns over. What are these comics doing to our children? Are they making them into juvenile delinquents? And so, the as a look, as a response to that, the industry self-regulated and created the comics code. And therefore, in every comic book in this um, in that during that era, you could not paint the government in a bad light. You couldn't paint policemen in a bad light. The super that's where you see the goody two shoes beaver. Um, uh, reification of the comic book genre. And it wasn't until um, they were able to break out of that mood by calling themselves graphic novels and we started getting comics like Watchmen and Sandman and taking a look at serious